Peter Dowd, how did you get involved in politics? When did you join the Labour Party? I joined the Labour Party in 1977, actually, so that's a long time ago. How old were you? I, was, I think I was 20. I was just 20. Um, and my family had been involved in politics for, oh, from the beginning of the last century, actually, the sort of 1910s, 1920s. So it was sort of part of my life that politics was always there. I had family members who'd been members of parliament and councillors and mayors and aldermen. So it was always... It was just, it was there, so to speak. It's, it's, it's like being, I'm an Everton supporter. Well, it, you're just an Everton supporter. You can't remember when you became an Everton supporter or a football supporter. You just, so that's the way it was. I just was brought up in, in the Labour Party and the Labour movement. Was it always your dream to become a Labour MP? Um, not particularly, no. I, I, I don't think it sort of, for me, it wasn't like that. I'd been involved in politics, as I said, and I was involved in social care as a social worker. Actually, still am, I still am a registered social worker, as it happens, but not particularly. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a name as such. And events happen, circumstances happen, and that's, I then got the Labour nomination and then, of course, was elected in my hometown of Bootle. What was it like growing up in Bootle? Well, it was interesting because it was a sort of, I was born in 1957, so it was a sort of, it was still that sort of post-war feeling, although I didn't realise that one. So there were lots of bombed houses still around that had been knocked down. There was still debris, as becomes the first French word I used, uh, ever learned, debris. Um, it was very, very sort of poor. Again, when you're young, you don't realise that, do you? And then there was what was called the slum clearance, so we moved out into the into the suburbs. So... Um, in, at that particular time, um, it was a sort of strange environment to, to be within, with all these houses that had been bombed and then all the slum clearance. So my, my, my early years were brought up in places where it would have been knocked down um, in one fashion or another, or had been knocked down. And it was, a, I suppose, in some regards, it was, a, it was a pretty dangerous place at times to be simply because of all that clearance that was, was going on. I was always getting told to keep out of the bombed houses, as we called it. And this is in the early 60s. And your mum and dad worked? Well, well, dad, that my dad had died when I was two. He, really? he Yeah, he died. And he sort of uh, complications from the Second World War. So he died when he was 48 in 1959. And then my mother, um, she, she was effective. She, she was a war widow. That's, she got a war widow's pension, which she had for 49 years till she died when she was 95. It was a big family. And it was, people thought it was poor. But of course, I was the youngest of eight children with sort of four sisters ahead of me. Um, so that sort of, to some extent, sets the scene in terms of, of, of being looked after and spoiled in a way, which I was. So I, I was protected from a lot of that... Uh, Poverty, but as I, I, I emphasize, I didn't feel it. To be fair, eight. There were eight, eight of you. Eight of us, yeah. Four, of... four sisters and three brothers. Everyone older than me, yes. Did you have to share? You had to share. Yes, a yes. Bedroom. I, yes, yes. Well, there were there were three bedrooms. I had to share it with my sister and mother, and three brothers, another room, and, f and three sisters in another room. So in a in a three bedroomed wow. old Victorian back to back house, basically, till I was eight and a half. Mm. Do you remember your dad? No, no, no recollection at all. Because I was just, I was just under two. I was twenty-three months when he died. So uh, no, I don't recollect him at all. Lots of times people talk about him. You almost felt as if he was there, but I didn't. I didn't know him. No. Peter, the most terrible thing happened to you. Tell me about what happened to Jenny, your daughter. Well, it was it was um, October, September twenty twenty. In fact, it was a Sunday morning about half past nine on a Sunday morning and I got a phone call from Jenny's wife to say Jenny had been out on a bike ride and she wasn't back and she was just wondering where she was because she couldn't contact her by phone and she said Jenny said if you're ever in bother ring ring my dad so to speak so she rang me and I just immediately thought something had happened so I rang for Zachary Hospital Entry Hospital as it's now known um, to say had that you know, anybody, young woman, turned up because I thought the worst. And that proved to be the worst. And she'd been admitted to the hospital having been involved in a hit and run uh, collision. And um, as it happens, it was about 100 yards from where I lived. 
So when I came out of the house at about half past nine, a quarter to ten on that beautiful Sunday morning, it was the road was blocked off because the police were there. And what I'd heard that morning was the air ambulance, sirens, etc. And I didn't know Jenny was lying a hundred yards away. Um, in the road, basically. So um, that's that's the circumstance surrounding it. And then um, she was badly brain damaged, it transpires, and then she died um, nine days later um, on the sixth of October. Um, so that was the that was the context, and you can imagine the shock, the trauma, the disbelief, and um, guilt. You know, because she's only 100 yards from the house and you're thinking, what happens if I had been in the garden when that happened and she went past on the bike? All those sort of things run through your mind. Um, so she was one of the 141 people killed, uh, cyclists killed on the road that year. There were about 4,000 seriously injured and about 12,000 with minor injuries. So she was one of those people whose lives have been affected by uh, in one fashion or another. How are you? Well, it's one of those things that you, you, you know, 18 months on, it's just, um, it's one of those things that'd be impossible ever to get over. And people I've spoken to, we've had colleagues in parliament who daughters had died or sons had died. And you, you, I don't think you ever get over it. Um, I certainly haven't come to terms with it as yet. Um, and neither of members of the family or Jenny's wife. It's one of those things that, you just don't know what the, the, the pathway will be for the future. Um, but it's, it's, it's traumatic and it affects you at different times and different places. That's an experience like that, does it, I noticed you, you, you quoted the statistics on cyclists' um, deaths. Has it led you to the experience of what you went through, whether the sentencing, the number of deaths on the road, has it has it led you to want to focus on some of those things and, and, and you're in a powerful position? I think the thing for me is, um, I think it's the issue about victims, because we're called victims. And I think for me, it's important that people who are in this situation, families who are in this situation, get all the support that they possibly can and that the prosecutorial services are as sensitive as they can be, the police are as sensitive as they can be, inevitably um, the hospital were absolutely fantastic. So what you try to do is you try to bring your experiences to work with some of those organisations possibly. Um, so recently I had a meeting with the, uh, the Minister from the Home Office to discuss victim support etc. So you can get some voice in amongst the, the many calls upon parliamentary time and organisations, home office time, etc. So you can play your part, uh, however small that might be, in sort of getting that message across that people in these circumstances need to be supported right throughout the, the, the process. And did you learn things about the criminal justice system that you weren't aware of? I think what you begin to understand is the, the stress that it can actually bring in terms of the the process because as much as the police want to help they can only tell you so much because mm. it's in this my daughter's case there was a criminal prosecution so there's you limited in a sense to the amount of information you can receive or that you can have plus the timelines are difficult to um to gauge we were in the middle of covid so that and no doubt had an impact upon things and um, the contact you could have with the police and those services tended to be um, tended to be, you know, via phone calls for the sake of argument. Um, mm -hmm. So, in a way, it's just trying to to manage all that grief and trauma in a circumstance that you're not fully aware of where all the facts are. And I, I read that you couldn't have a you couldn't have a funeral in the way you would have wanted to without had we not been living through COVID. Yes, and that was that was. You know, you can imagine we have a big family. We just talked about how many members, brothers and sisters have. So we have a big family and lots of friends. And she had scores of friends. And she worked in the NHS. So she had lot, she'd, she'd, she'd really sort of had this great sort of 
support system, life, social life. Um, and we couldn't because we could only have 30 people at the funeral and of course 30 people afterwards at the um, at the function, so to speak, at the, it wasn't even a memorial service, it was the post-funeral. Um, but we were able to get together sort of on a birthday last year, near to a birthday last year to celebrate with all the friends, uh, celebrate a life. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't a good time in terms of not being able to have everybody there to talk, to chat, to grieve, to discuss, tell stories, etc., which we normally do in those circumstances. So one of eight. Yes. Have you got the poshest job out of all your siblings? Um, <laughs> I, th I wouldn't call it that. I, 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 no, I don't think I don't think I'd call it the poshest job type of thing. Some people think I've got the cushiest job, <laughs> basically, uh, which I must probably have to be quite honest. Out of them all, I suspect. You know. Do you love it? I, well, I do like politics. I, I do like politics, and I think if you're a sort of gregarious person, I think I'm a gregarious person. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I'm, you're very maybe, warm. Maybe I'm not as gregarious as I used to be, but I'm a gregarious sort. So politics is for people, if you want uh, to be gregarious, it's a great um, profession to be in. So yes, I do like politics, but I like doing things. It's not being there for the sake of it. And you're the same. You want to do things. You want to achieve things. You want to get things on the agenda. So that's what I want to do. Do you like coming to London every week? Um, not particularly. No, I hated it. <laughs> not particularly. I come down and get back as soon as I practically can, to be honest. And I think lots of our colleagues in Parliament are and were like that. So um, it's a place of work. I think of it as a place of work uh, and, and treat it accordingly, basically, and get back home as soon as I can. Peter Dowd, thank you. Thank you for being open. Everybody at... GB News and everybody who's watching, I'm sure, will send that absolute love to your family. And um, Jenny sounds like the most incredible woman. And we're sorry you lost her. Thank you for being open with us. Thank you.